Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome back. I'm glad to see that some of you have come back. Most of you have come back. Great, awesome. All right, so like Tuesday, we're gonna spend a few minutes going over the logistics uh, to make sure we're all on the same page, and then we'll get back to the topic we all know and love, robotics. Uh, there was a question here about the readings. Um, you can do the readings for that day uh, before lecture, you can do them after lecture, doesn't matter. Uh, the lecture, the reading will not necessarily prepare you for that day's lecture. So before, after, doesn't matter. Any other questions about the syllabus, things we went over on Tuesday? So when we're trying to submit a homework assignment, yes. so do we make a Reddit post, if we, if we already just like have a Reddit account, do we make a Reddit post and just like throw our name on it somewhere? Got it, okay. There's a question about how to submit assignments. Let's talk about that. I realize it's obscenely confusing. Uh, as usual, part of that is because of my fault, uh, from my fault. Okay, we got a lot of moving pieces. We've got Brightspace. Uh, actually, no, we've got a Google Sheet. Everything more or less can be found here on the schedule or, the, or on Brightspace. As you can see here, uh, last Tuesday, I assigned all of the undergraduates here assignment one. As you can see, this link will take you to Brightspace. It should take you to assignment one uh, in Brightspace. There are links in Brightspace that'll take you to Reddit and walk you through everything you need to do for that assignment. When you complete assignment one and all the other assignments, you will have in hand one or more screenshots or one or more videos. In this, uh, in this course, you're gonna show us rather than tell us that you completed an assignment. We are not gonna look at any of your code. Uh, if you come to see the TA or me and you say, my code is crashing, please debug it for us, uh, for me, we will politely return your laptop to you. We are not in the business of debugging your code for you. We will work backward with you from your screenshots and videos if something shows up that is amiss. Okay, so how do you show us rather than tell us? As I mentioned, at the end of every assignment, you're gonna generate screenshots and YouTube videos if, uh, or, or videos. If you would prefer not to leave a digital footprint, you can upload those images and videos directly to Brightspace and not leave anything on YouTube, Imager, Reddit. That's perfectly fine. All good? Uh, that's fine. If you do want to leave a digital footprint, if you want to put stuff up on Reddit, Imager, YouTube, that's fine as well. You would uh, put stuff on Imager and YouTube, which obviously generates links. You would create a Reddit post. I, here's my solution to assignment one. And in that Reddit post, you would put the links to your images and videos. And then finally, you take that Reddit link and embed it back into Brightspace. Option A, option B, both are fine with us. Okay, and so when we just put that Reddit link in Brightspace, that's the association between our names and the posts? Exactly, okay. because when you submit, all we really care about is your submission in Brightspace. Obviously, that's non-anonymized. We know who it's coming from. Nate. So the reason for all the online stuff is so that we can see each other's work and tell me about that. Good point, yeah. So why, are, why, why would you submit something online so that everyone can see your submission and you can see everyone else's? As I mentioned last time, you're working your way through these assignments and ultimately a final project on your own, but I would, I would encourage you to socialize your work along the way. Here's my solution to assignment I. My robot seems to be limping, it's falling down. Everybody else's robot, uh, that I see here on Reddit is not falling down. Does anybody have any suggestions? I'm hoping that you can generate a little bit of dialogue on Reddit or whatever online space you want to use. That's perfectly fine. So there are 64 of you taking this course and there will be anywhere from a dozen to several hundred people also shadowing you just on the net. Obviously all the assignments are on Reddit. I post that we're running evolutionary robotics yet again this spring, and people will follow along at their own pace. So some of the quote unquote students you might be interacting with in the subreddit are not necessarily in this course. That's why you might choose 
to submit your work online. But again, completely optional. All good? OK, a uh, couple other housekeeping notes. Um, uh, if you miss the first few minutes of class on Tuesday or you are newly enrolled in this class and you missed Tuesday's lecture, you can go back uh, and find the recording of Tuesday's lecture and all the logistics are described there, how this course runs. Yeah. Okay, so walking around, uh, continuing to walk around the schedule. Uh, here's the quiz posted for the undergraduates, which I posted uh, Tuesday around midday. Hopefully all of you took that quiz by 11.59 p.m. Here's the quiz for the graduate students. Uh, as I mentioned, here's the recording, here's the reading from last time, and as you can see, all of the undergrads, you're working on assignment one. Some of you may have already finished that. The graduate students, you should be working on assignments one and two, which are due uh, at 11.59 p.m. this coming Monday. One additional detail about submitting your work on Brightspace which I didn't know about on Tuesday, is uh, it's forcing you to upload a file. My apologies about that. I see that most of you just uploaded your screenshot or a video. That's perfectly fine. We will be very forgiving with what you submit this week. I'm hoping that when I set up assignments uh, three and four, you, uh, you don't have to upload a file. You should just be able to upload a Reddit link or if you want to not leave a digital footprint, you should be able to directly upload screenshots and videos. We will see. I will work on that and report back on Tuesday. Okay, anything else about uh, the mechanics of the course you want to talk about? Okay, uh, let's talk about assignment one and two itself. Uh, for those of you that have tackled assignment one, you might find that it's surprisingly easy. There's not a lot of steps. Um, in assignment one, you're installing the underlying physics engine that we're gonna be using for this course, which is called PyBullet. That's it's just a, a publicly available physics engine. Hopefully, over the years, we've worked out all the installation issues for Mac, Linux, uh, Windows. Has any run, anyone run into any installation issues? A couple of people. Okay. Um, so if you're having installation issues, please, please, please come and see the teaching assistant or myself as soon as possible so we can resolve that. It, hopefully, for most of you, installation was very smooth sailing and off you go. Yeah? Okay, that's the first part of assignment one. The second part of assignment two is now making sure that you did install the, install the physics engine correctly by creating a, mis a minimal simulation. At the end of assignment one, you should have a window that pops up on your laptop that shows you a virtual world that has nothing in it except an infinite flat plane. How many people have got that far so far? Most of you, okay, great. All right, so obviously that's the foundation. We wanna just make sure that we have our physics engine up and running and assignments two through 10, you're gonna be adding stuff to that simulation and then eventually wrapping that simulation in an evolutionary algorithm. It's gonna be evolving robots in that simulator. All good? Okay, anything else about logistics? Questions, comments? Okay, so we are gonna finish lecture one uh, now, and then we will move on to lecture two, a short history of AI. I see that I've already fumbled with the numbering scheme here. I will fix that after class. Okay, off we go. Okay, I think this is as far as we got uh, last time. Uh, we were talking about the why of evolutionary robotics or the why of robotics in general. Why create autonomously train or design autonomous machines? One reason for doing this is the four R's. Uh, the four, not the four R's, the four D's. Typically, we want to create robots to do jobs that are dull, distant, distant, meaning on another planet, dull, dirty, distant, and I'm missing one of the four R's. Dangerous. dangerous, thank you. Those are the four D's. Dangerous, <laughs> dull, dirty, and distant. Okay. 
Okay, so we did a little bit of the why last time. Let's do a little bit of the what. This what, what, this what on the screen at the moment was one of the questions for the quiz last time. My apologies, we didn't get to it on Tuesday. Okay, four things, generally speaking, you need if you're going to autonomously evolve autonomous machines. We obviously need the task environment itself. What ultimately is the D? What is the environment in which we're going to deploy a robot to do some job? Obviously, we need the robot itself. That robot is an autonomous machine. It's not remote controlled, which means at every point in time, our autonomous machine, regardless of whether it's a physical robot, or a virtual robot operating in a virtual world is going to be receiving sensory information. It's going to be using that brain or that artificial neural network, like your biological neural network up here, that's going to take in sensory information, transform it somehow, maybe combine it with past experience and past memories, and then send commands to the motors so that the robot can act. That is what allows it to be autonomous. How exactly should the robot's brain transform sensation into action? That is a notoriously difficult problem to solve. So in this course, we are not going to solve that problem manually. We're going to let an evolutionary algorithm solve it for us. OK, here's an old experiment, one of my old experiments where you can sort of see this evolutionary process sped up. What's the task environment here? Very briefly. Uh, the ground with a blue cube in it. A ground with a blue cube in it. OK, not, not very difficult, not, ver not very complex. That's the environment. What do you think the task is? We're already evolving this robot to do something. Picking up the cube. Pick up the cube, right? Not that complicated. OK, so there's the task environment. You can obviously see the robot. You cannot see its brain or its artificial neural network. But at every frame in this video, the robot is receiving sensory information that is flowing through an uh, ANN inside the robot. And that ANN is outputting commands to the motors, which cause the robot to move. Yeah, so you can see task environment, see the robot, can't see its brain, and you obviously can't really see the evolutionary process. I'm showing you snapshots during this evolutionary process. As I mentioned uh, last time, in a nutshell, what this evolutionary algorithm is doing at, in this experiment is evolving not just one brain, but a population of different brains, slightly different ways in which the robot transforms sensation into action. We have a whole stack of these brains. Each one is downloaded into the virtual robot one after the other, which causes the robot to do a bunch of different things, such as kind of pick up the block or fumble the block. For each one of those brains that's downloaded into the robot, the evolutionary algorithm is watching the virtual robot and assigning a score. How well does the robot do at lifting the block? The brains that cause the robot to do a poor job of picking up the block, those brains are deleted. The surviving brains, which cause the robot to do a slightly better job of picking up the block, survived. The evolutionary algorithm randomly chooses some of those surviving brains, makes copies of those brains, and introduces slight changes to those brains which, when those new brains are dropped into the robot, cause the robot to interact with its environment in a slightly different way. So something like this, is the evolutionary algorithm designing the architecture of the brain, the weights of the brain, or both? Great question. So the question is, is the evolutionary algorithm designing the architecture of the brain? How many neurons, how few neurons? Which synapses connect which neurons together? That's known as the architecture of the brain or the architecture of the neural network. Or is it tuning the strength of those synapses or those connections between neurons? Do we have a fixed architecture that we decide, and the only thing we let the evolutionary algorithm do is tinker with the strength of those connections? 
We're going to get to that. Some of you have not heard these terms before. The short answer is, in this video, it's the latter. We have fixed the architecture. Actually, we, I, ran this experiment years ago. I set the number of neurons inside the brain of this robot. I said which neurons are connected together with synapses. And the only thing the evolutionary algorithm is doing is strengthening or weakening the connections between these neurons, which for our purposes today has an effect on the robot. It causes it to react to its sensory stimulation in slightly different ways. So far, so good? Um, are you also setting like what the what success is, like what parameters go into like, a successful attempt? Yes, I am setting what goes into a successful attempt. So obviously we're trying to stay still at the 10,000 foot view in this first week of the semester. We're gonna spend the whole rest of this course talking about all these four components, but it's a good question. So if we dive inside the evolutionary algorithm, which as the name implies, it's an algorithm, it's just a computer program, somewhere in that computer program is a mathematical expression that the evolutionary algorithm takes and applies to each one of these short video sequences that you see. And that equation is gonna result in a single number which is how well the robot did at picking up the block. And I wrote that success equation, which is known as a fitness function. Fitness function. It's a function that takes in the behavior of the robot and gives back a scalar, a single floating point number. How well did the robot do at lifting the block? Yes, question here. How long did each attempt take? How long did each attempt take? Let's see. So. I ran this experiment in 2008, so it's getting pretty dated. Uh, it was a standard desktop machine at that time. You can see how long each attempt takes in the video. It's, it's about a second, half a second for each attempt. On a 2008 machine, I think it took longer to run on the machine than it actually takes to visualize it. One of the things we're gonna talk about when we talk about physics engines which simulate our task environment are different ways of measuring time. When you're looking at this video, you're looking at animation time, right? I could run this animation faster, slower. There's simulation time, which is how much time is passing inside the simulation from the robot's perspective, which is a little bit confusing. Simulating that short video sequence on a laptop takes a, about a, a certain amount of time in wall clock time. It, ta it took my 2008 desktop a certain amount of time to generate that half second video. I probably confused most of you at this point, right? So there's time from the perspective of the robot, the time it takes the laptop to run the simulation, and the time I choose to run the resulting animation. More questions? Do you think with today's technology it would be like an instant? It's way, way faster. You're all going to get to this point, uh, I think at about assignment four or five, and you'll see for yourself, absolutely. No matter how crappy your laptop is in 2023, it's going to run, you're going to be able to simulate something of this complexity way faster than what you're seeing right now. Okay, so again, in a nutshell, I just walked you through an evolutionary algorithm. Simulate a whole bunch of things, evaluate how well the robots do, delete the bad ones, make randomly modified copies of the good ones. What you're seeing in this video on the left, I'm not showing you any of the bad ones. At every generation in the evolutionary algorithm, every time I repeat this process of simulating every bot, deleting the bad ones, randomly copying the good ones, that's one generation. Then we do it again and again and again. So what you're seeing, each half second video here, you're seeing the best brain in the population during that generation. So what you're watching is actually snapshots over evolutionary time where you're seeing the, the champion, the one that has the highest floating point value of fitness in the population at that time. So far so good? Okay, so what's happening? Yeah. 
Is it working? <clears throat> Looks like it's getting better. Looks like it's getting better, yeah? It's getting there, getting there, okay. What I'm gonna show you in the next video is exactly the same experiment, but we're gonna speed things up even faster. We're gonna plot evolutionary time on the horizontal axis here, and I'm gonna use a big G to represent generations. On the vertical axis, I'm gonna plot fitness which is how good the robot is doing at grasping the object. I'm gonna pause for a moment here. What you saw in the video on the left is the champion, the best robot in the, in the population in the first generation, second generation, third generation, fourth generation, fifth generation. It's getting better and better. Fitness is going up and up. It's getting better and better at grasping the block until at some point, and this is some arbitrary threshold of fitness that I set. I said, once a brain evolves that causes the robot to do the job well enough, something's gonna happen. Um, if we only see the best brain in each generation, is there, how do you determine like the diminishing point of what a larger population could do? Great question. So we could use 100 brains, we could use a population of 200 brains, 300 brains, and maybe this curve, fitness would increase faster. This is a good point. We'll come back to this when we talk about evolutionary algorithms. You mentioned diminishing, right? There's a diminishing return. After a while, generating or evolving a larger and larger population of brains only gets you so much more fitness. It's a really good point. We'll come back to that when we talk about evolutionary algorithms. For our purposes today, you've seen in this left video that at some point the robot does a good enough job of picking up the block. And when it does, in this experiment, something changes. What happens at the, at the point in evolutionary time when fitness is sufficiently high? The, the changes get pretty small. The changes get pretty small, not, uh, kind of. Moving the block. Moving the block. So the code is set up, the evolutionary algorithm is set up so that when a brain appears in the evolving population that causes the robot to grasp and pull the block onto its back, the code makes a change to the task environment. It places the block a little bit further away from the robot. What do you think happens to this particular brain that was successfully able to lift the block when the block was close to the robot? What happens to that brain? It becomes a little less fit. Absolutely. And you don't see this in this video because I'm skipping ahead so quickly. Fitness function stays the same. Evolve a brain that causes the robot to grasp the object and lift it. So over this entire experiment, which we haven't finished describing yet, the fitness function stays the same. It's always the same. What is changing over evolutionary time is the given population of brains. Again, we're not seeing those, but those are evolving and changing over time. And every once in a while, we're also changing the task environment. Question. It's not necessarily obvious that you would want to change the task environment. Is that because like, that's how we observe evolution happening in our world? Is yep. that sort of as, our, as we evolve, our environment changes because we evolve? That's a fantastic question, right? So if I can boil down your question to why. Why did the experimenter in this case choose to put this additional detail into this experiment? Why keep moving the block? slightly further away from the robot. You can probably guess from watching this video on the right, ultimately what we want the robot to do, which is go get the trash can, pick it up, and then do something with it, right? So why didn't we just start the experiment with putting the block really far away? We didn't do that, why not? Because it would have been a harder first feat to get it to move all that distance rather than to get it to do something Closer to it. Absolutely, right? I'm going to administer you, I've changed my mind, I'm going to give you a final exam in evolutionary robotics, right? 
not a very smart thing for me to do. You're not ready for it yet, right? So there's an additional twist in this experiment, which again we'll talk about uh, later in the course. It's called scaffolding. We do this all the time with our children. We make their environments easy so they can start to learn a task. And then once they start to demonstrate competence, we make things a little bit more difficult. We put training wheels on the bicycle, and once we as parents or caregivers see that they're getting better at riding the bicycle, we take off the training wheels. So once you've kind of moved, started moving the block away, and I'm sure there's, it's going to move in other ways later, does it still perform well on like the initial? That's a great, that's a great question. So the, one, the robots you're seeing in the right-hand video, if we were to put them back in the original environment, would they do a good job? And the short answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no. How might you improve this evolutionary algorithm so that they quote unquote don't forget? They're still good at the original thing. That is a fantastic question. It is still an open question in robotics and AI. And we'll probably come back to that as well. Great question, super difficult. Okay, so what's happening over here when we move the block, fitness drops, but evolution finds a new set of brains that cause the robot to pick up that block. Then we move the block again, and this is what you're seeing. Tell me about the evolving behaviors. What's going on here? Let's put on our scientist hat. Give me some observations. It's like always able to grab no matter how far ahead it is. Yep. Okay, so it's doing kind of what we said, right? It's able to grasp the block even as the block moves further and further away. Well, what it seems to be doing is bringing together two activities in that it always attempts to grab everything that it can grab. It's, it, in this case, you can actually see the strategy that evolution is converging on which is, as you say, to chain together or connect stepping with grasping. That behavior is not specified in the fitness function. The only thing I asked for was grab the block and lift it onto your back. It's a, it's a side effect of the evolutionary process. You could re rewind this evolutionary, type, uh, evolutionary tape and evolve brains again, and you may or may not get that specific behavior. Other observations? Uh, I was just curious. Uh, maybe this is how you drew the graph. But it seems like even when you change the task environment, the uh, fitness never drops back to zero. Oh, OK. So I, what I'm showing you in the video on the right, I'm sorry, I should have explained that. You're only seeing these behaviors. You're seeing all the quote unquote successful ones, the ones that got above this fitness threshold. You're not seeing all of these. Some of these do actually drop back down to zero and it has to kind of improve. Others don't drop as, as far. There's some interesting, rich evolutionary dynamics going on, but in this first week, we're hiding those details from you. Um, in the real world, it's sometimes like, instead of survival of the fittest, it's survival of the good enough. Ah, okay. So like, did you notice when you were running this that like, before you reached the success parameter, you would get different ways of picking up the block and moving, and then that would guide the rest of the iterations. That's a yes. Okay, so that many good points in there. First point that you brought up is that an evolutionary algorithm and biological evolution is not an optimizer. Major rookie mistake is to think of these processes as optimizing, meaning they find the best solution. Human beings are wonderful, wonderful creatures. As we all know, we are not perfect. What, what biological evolution is, and an evolutionary algorithm is, is a satisficer. Be good enough. Be good enough to survive long enough to produce offspring and feed them, and you're good. In this simple case, be good enough to grasp the block and lift it onto your back this good. Beyond that, we don't know. 
We don't know, even in this simple experiment, what the optimal behavior is. For all we know, this robot could actually leap directly to the block and lift it really, really fast onto its back. Who knows? Maybe that's the optimal solution. We don't know, and in most experiments, we can't know. Did you ever consider like penalizing the extra movement in some ways to try to like get rid of the like to, to like make it more efficient in its movements. Great point. So we could add to the fitness function a penalty, actually minus sign. We could remove we could remove points if the robot, as you mentioned, is moving inefficiently. What else could we penalize aside from extraneous motion? Taking a longer amount of time. Take a longer amount of time to get there. What else? What else is the robot doing? that in retrospect, maybe we didn't want it to do. We want it to grasp and lift the block. Flip it. Flip it, OK? Yeah, maybe this is a very fragile scientific instrument, right? We've dropped carefully scientific instrument onto the surface of Mars, and we sent this rover later, and it's throwing scientific instruments all over the place, right? It's a good way to solve the problem, get the object onto its back as quickly as possible, but in retrospect, Maybe not what we wanted. OK, this is, I would argue, the biggest problem in AI and robotics at the moment. It's known by different names. In this course, we're going to refer to it as perverse instantiation. The evolutionary algorithm is instantiating what we want it to do as a behavior. But it's in, in many cases, and I could see some of you laughing, which is the point, it's instantiating it in a way perversely. In many ways, as you'll see with your own evolved robots, evolved robots are like teenagers. They do what you ask them to do, but in the way, in retrospect, you absolutely did not want them to do it. It's hilarious when we're watching virtual creatures, not so hilarious when we're trying to train an autonomous vehicle to move in a densely populated area. It's also known as the value alignment problem. It's usually known as the value alignment problem in AI. In robotics, it's usually known as perverse instantiation. They generally mean the same thing. We want a robot to obey not just what we said, but the spirit behind what we said. OK, one last observation I hope I can extract from all of you about this video on the right. What else strikes you about this? Okay. Every time it grabbed, and I don't know if that would have a destabilizing effect, or if it was to stabilize, or if that. Great question. So there's a little hitch in the back right leg. Is that helping locomotion? Is it hindering? And it's something that the evolutionary algorithm just hasn't ironed out of the uh, locomotory gate yet. There's a gazillion of these things that pop up all the time. All that matters from the evolutionary algorithm's point of view is that the behavior is good enough. OK, in the interest of time, you'll probably notice that there is a diversity of solutions. And again, some of them are a little bit more perverse than others. One of the, uh, one of the advantages of evolutionary algorithms compared to a lot of other AI uh, optimization methods is diversity. The evolutionary algorithm can give you back not just one solution to your problem, but a large number of them that are diverse. That is, diversity is one possible way to start to combat perverse instantiation. Hopefully, in that diverse set of solutions, there are one or a few that, do, that cause the robot to do what you wanted, and in retrospect, the way you would have wanted the robot to do it. Tricky thing to do. OK, let's move on. OK, I, I interspersed uh, some of these cool videos with a little bit more logistics. So my apologies. We're going to do a little bit more and then back to robotics. OK, attendance. 
Again, it's a bit of a pain. I collected data over the years. If you can't read, uh, if you can't read the, uh, the text here, that's fine. We've got percent grade on the horizontal axis. Every point here represents a student who took this class in 2015, 16, 17, and 18 for a total of 164 students. The vertical axis is how many classes they missed. The higher the point is, the less time they spent uh, in class. And you can see that the students that did well tended to come to class. So come to class. OK. All right, uh, a little bit about me. Um, as I mentioned, I actually work in this field of evolutionary robotics. I love teaching this course. It's what I spend my time doing. Uh, I went to school as a computer science undergraduate uh, in Canada. I went to go work for a year and found that my happy place was not in a cubicle. So I came back to school. I did a master's degree uh, in England in a master's program called Evolutionary and Adaptive Systems. The acronym for this course is E-A-S-Y, the easy course. It is absolutely not an easy course. For the undergraduates that are taking this class and you're considering a master's program, and if you find anything we're talking about in this course interesting, this program still exists. I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, I did my PhD uh, for four years uh, in Switzerland, uh, working in a robotics lab, um, thus evolutionary robotics. I spent three years after my PhD working in a mechanical engineering and aerospace engineering department at Cornell, where we were developing or applying some of these evolutionary ideas to some of the things NASA cares about. And we'll come back to that in a few weeks. And I've been here uh, since 2006. OK. All right, I would usually ask about you. When I started this course, there were 12 of you, and we had time to go around the circle and do that. We now have 64 of you. I'm afraid we don't. I hope I get to know some of you better in office hours. Come see me and let's chat. Expectations. I ask you a lot of questions in class. I can see that you're already very responsive, so great feedback so far. Common sense. Uh, you have to submit assignment one and two. Brightspace is forcing you to upload a file. Upload a file, we'll work around it. Common sense. OK, as I already mentioned last time, regular but not necessarily perfect attendance. You're going to do a lot of coding in this class. You're going to do a lot of coding, especially towards the end of this course. Use GitHub, teach yourself GitHub, work hard, keep on top of things, and you'll be fine. OK. I expect memorization of key concepts. I have absolutely no way to enforce this. There's no closed book final exam. Uh, I don't think there's any need to put you through that painful uh, process. Do, as we go, try your best to absorb the key concepts. Job interviews do tend to be closed book. A lot of the interesting and high paying jobs that are out there, you got to, in the interview, you have to stand at the whiteboard and talk about what you did, for example, in this class. And you got to be able to rattle off some of these concepts and connect them to whatever you did in this class. Okay. You're going to have lots of opportunities, as you probably figured out, to be creative in this class, especially in your final project. I expect uh, at this level a lot of self learning. If you don't know GitHub, teach yourself GitHub. We're going to use a lot of different Python libraries in this course, matplotlib, numpy, scipy. Uh, we're not going to go through them in class. If you come across something you don't know, there's this thing called Google. Get on Google, Google it, and I'm pretty sure there'll be a thousand tutorials for you to make your way through. OK, positive attitude when working with me, the TAO fellow students, goes without saying. OK, I already mentioned this. Uh, things you cannot expect. Why is my program clashing, crashing? I don't know. You don't know. Um, as I just mentioned, we're not going to help you learn Python or installing software. You should be able to work that out. With one exception, if you're having problems installing PyBullet this week, come and see us and we will help you with that. Yeah? OK. Uh, OK. Um, what you can expect from me or the TA when you come to office hours, we will help with specific programming questions, but we'll assume you've kind of tried your best to figure, it, figure out an answer online first. I leave this example here as a historical artifact. Um, the first students who took this course had to program everything in C++. 
A couple years after that, it was half C++ and half Python. Now it's all Python. Assuming this class still exists five years from now, I'm sure it'll be something completely uh, different. That connects with the last thing you can expect in this class is that there's going to be an emphasis on concepts rather than specific tools. Programming languages, GitHub, Google Drive, all these things, they come and go. But core concepts like evolution, scaffolding, these ideas have been around for a very long time and they will continue probably to be around for a very long time. I do not expect you in this course, as we start moving through the course, to remember every detail of every experiment we see. That's not my point. Uh, that's not my goal in this course. It's to use all of these examples you're going to see to reinforce some of the core concepts in this class that we're going to see over and over again in different guises. Okay. Uh, conceptual issues. So there's certain conceptual issues that might arise in, in, in and coding up these assignments that you haven't seen before, like object-oriented uh, programming. For the grad students, we're going to get to differentiable physics engines starting in week six. There are some pretty hairy conceptual things underlying some of these things. Those things I love to talk about. Come, come to office hours and we can discuss. Okay. Clarification about assignments and projects, please absolutely ask me. Two or three of you already started in on assignment one right after class on Tuesday, and you immediately found things that I did wrong. Thank you for stumbling over those things on behalf of your fellow students. I fix them as quickly as I can and send out an announcement to the rest of the class. You can, uh, you can Teams DM me, you can email me, you can raise your hand at the beginning of class, doesn't matter. Please raise any clarification issues, and we'll try and iron those things out as quickly as possible. Okay, we've already kind of talked about this. All of, these, all of the assignments are embedded at the top level in Brightspace. They direct you to Reddit. You're generating images or videos. You can dump them here if you want, or, and then embed them in Reddit, submit your Reddit link back in Brightspace, or you can go Brightspace, Reddit, generate images and videos, and embed them right back in your Brightspace submission. Okay, as promised, um, at, starting in week 11, everyone will get started on a final project. I'm not gonna read all of this. As I said last time, you can, at the end of your 10 programming pro uh, projects, 10 programming assignments, you can pick some aspect of that code base and elaborate it. You could make your fitness function more complicated. Grab the block, lift it onto your back, and walk as far as you can with the block, and then maybe put it down. Or evolve to climb up some steps, or what have you. So I put some links to a few uh, assignments, uh, a few final projects from previous year's students. Uh, here's a best of a highlight reel.
Okay. All right. Turn the lights back on. All right. Um, I I challenge you to count the number of examples of perverse instantiation you see in this class. You should already be on your second hand, right, at this point. Okay. Just a, a typical example of the kinds of things that are possible within four weeks of effort. One of the things um, that I want, even if you're already starting to think about final projects, uh, a challenge in week 11 is going to be coming up with an idea that's doable within four weeks. Few of you are going to have a good way to estimate that. Come and see me in the TA or send us a message about what you're thinking and we'll help calibrate that for you. Yeah. One of the other things I want you to remember from that highlight reel is you're going to have two minutes or maybe two and a half minutes during the final exam period to convince us that something actually evolved. The best way to do that is to show a before and after video. Here's what some random brains cause the robot to do in your task environment. And here's what some evolved brains cause the robot to do. Hopefully, most of you within about five or six seconds could see immediately that these particular students' evolutionary algorithms were working. That's what the TA and I are going to be looking for in those two or two and a half minutes. That's the most important thing. OK. Questions? So far, so good? All right. OK. All right. Now I promise I'm done with all the logistics of the course. Back to the why. Now we're going to talk, up till now we've been kind of talking about the why of robotics in general. Why are we going to evolve robots rather than to use all the other high powered uh, machine learning machinery that's out there? Um, I'm going to show you four different reasons. The first one is that creating a controller or a brain for a robot is a very difficult thing to do. Programming a brain for the robot so that it always transforms sensation into action in the right way for the robot to do whatever it is you want it to do, super, super hard. Now, admittedly, there are, they do, they now exist machine learning algorithms that are not evolutionary algorithms that can also do this. For our purposes, we're going to use evolution to do this. Just as an illustration of how hard it is to actually program a brain for a robot, I want you to consider the nonoped robot, which you see uh, in the bottom left. I mentioned that I was at Cornell before here, and we were working on a project for NASA. This was one part of that project. The nonoped is called the nonoped because it's got nine legs, as you see in the bottom left. But they're non -legs, uh, nine legs that are kind of arranged in a non-obvious way. The nonoped is built from two Stuart platforms. Here's a GIF of a Stuart platform in action. A Stuart platform, as you can see, has a bottom and a top. And the bottom and the top are connected together with one, two, three, four, five, and the sixth is behind there, six pistons. There, at every frame of this GIF, there are six numbers going to those pistons, telling the piston whether to compress or extend. As those six pistons expand and contract, they cause the upper and lower plate to move and twist relative to one another. That's a Stuart platform. I don't expect you to remember all the details of a Stuart platform. We take one Stuart platform and we attach it end to end. There's one Stuart platform. There's the other one. And we have the nonoped. Each Stuart platform has six pistons. If we have two Stuart platforms, that means we have 12 pistons. Imagine you were in control of the nonoped. We want this nonoped to walk from the left side of this wooden cage to the right side of this wooden cage as fast as possible. Let's assume that you're going to actually manually program a controller for this nonoped. At every, let's say, one second, one second, two seconds, three seconds, at every second, you got to figure out which 12 numbers to send to those 12 pistons. I'm going to make things easier for you. You can choose either a number, you can choose either minus one, which tells that piston to compress. 
So in this example here, um, someone has written down a matrix which tells the second piston or the second motor attached to the piston to compress in the first second and then in the second second to expand. The plus one up here tells the first piston to extend, stay extended at the second second, stay extended at second three, four, five, compress at second, uh, the sixth second, and so on. So we've simplified things greatly for you here. The brain of this robot is a binary matrix. Okay, what is it? We want the robot to move from the left side of the wooden cage to the right side of the wooden cage. What should the 12 pistons do? This is not a rhetorical question. Can you do it? I feel like you might want all of the ones like on the right to expand. Okay, so all the ones at the right here, which for our purposes, let's assume this is the front of the nonoped. So we want all these six to expand, yeah, okay? You want those ones to contract as the left ones expand maybe and kind of like slink along. Okay, so maybe do something like a slinky, right? Ex expand the front part of the body, shrink the back, shrink the front, expand the back, expand the front. We're gonna talk about biomechanics in a few weeks time. What I think you're describing is actually a really good guess because it is the simplest form of motion in the animal kingdom. It's known as peristalsis. An earthworm, as it pushes its way through the earth, the front part of its body expands and pushes the earth out of the way. Then it sort of holds the sides of that new tunnel with its body, shrinks its back, which means since it's anchored at the front, the back part of the earthworm comes forward. The front part contracts, the back part expands, the front part extends forward and pushes into the earth, then expands, the back part contracts, and that pumping motion is known as peristalsis. A really good solution, which might potentially work for the nonoped. That peristaltic strategy was discovered by Mother Nature a very, very long time ago, and she's repurposed that strategy many, many times in many, many different species, it's in you also. You also peristalt, not to move. We use these things to move. Where is peristalsis in you? Uh, is it like your intestines and stuff and you can expand them? Absolutely, right? The moment you swallow something, the, mus the muscles in your throat can expand and contract and push not earth out of the way, but food down into your stomach. Okay, bit of a digression. Okay, great guess. As you, can get, as you can imagine, since there's so much lead up to this, it's not so simple as that. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna turn off the lights again. That's the best we could do by hand. That's us. This is the evolutionary algorithm. Okay. There were hundreds, I'm gonna turn the lights back on. Those were the, a few of the hundreds and hundreds of different gates that this uh, particular robot came up with. Uh, the evolution, we did this experiment in 2004. 
Uh, we couldn't run uh, electronics, we couldn't run everything on board the robot. So we were evolving the brains on a laptop, and then the brain would reach through an Ethernet cable to control the 12 pistons. Inside the belly of the nonoped, it's a little hard to see, there's a little pressurized air canister, which comes from a, a paint gun, a paintball gun, which is supplying compressed air to the 12 pistons. Uh, myself and another graduate student sat next to this robot in its cage for 18 hours, and I, my job was to hit enter every 30 seconds after the evolutionary algorithm had tried out one brain on the robot. It's quite an experiment. I still, uh, still have flashbacks. Okay. All right. So just a reminder. Yes, question. Why is there nine legs? Good point. Hint, this is a, pro a prototype for NASA. Why the nine legs? So that in the non-gravity One of the things that keeps NASA engineers awake at night is what happens if a rover slips on some scree and ends up on its back. As far as we know, there's no one there to put it back on its wheels or legs. The nonoped, in theory, should be able to roll down uh, a pretty long slope, and no matter which way it lands, it can keep going. Was there like a gyroscope on it to determine? No gyroscope, no sensors. This was a very stripped down initial prototype. As I mentioned, we're just, the evolutionary algorithm was evolving matrices, was evolving binary matrices that just control how the robot moves. No sensors. Okay. All right. Okay. Typically speaking, most non-evolutionary algorithms, which we're gonna, I'm going to uh, use different synonyms for now, training algorithms, things that train the robot. By, the, by that very verb, training, it implies that the body is fixed and the algorithm is only altering the brain of the robot. That is, as I mentioned before, not what evolution does. Evolution doesn't train animals or plants with fixed body plans. Mother Nature is continuously tinkering with body and brain. We're going to see some evolutionary algorithms in which the evolutionary algorithm is only tinkering with the brain. The real interesting stuff, in my opinion, will be towards the end of the semester where we see evolutionary algorithms gradually tinkering with more and more of the body and brain of the robot. Yeah. Okay, as of uh, Monday, this was probably sort of the state of the art in autonomous robotics. This is Google's Palm e-robot, which has been the beneficiary of a lot of computational resources from Google to train the heck out of this machine so that it can do things like obey the command, bring me the green star, uh, bring me the green star. Okay. I don't know how carefully orchestrated this video is. I don't know how close this particular robot is to a practical reality. As you can imagine, the big AI companies keep a lot of this under very close, that knowledge under very close wraps. What would happen if the command we issued to this particular robot was, I think I dropped something behind the drawers inside the cabinet. Can you please look inside and see if there's something back there? I obviously cooked this example so that the body of this robot cannot obey. From what I can see from the video, its arm and hand is too big to get back there, and its camera, which is up here, is probably not able to do it. Now, with enough training, maybe this robot could figure out how to go grab a dental mirror and put it kind of under and sort of do something like this. But what happens if the robot comes back and says, I know what you want me to do. I can't do it. Imagine that robot goes and says that to a 3D printer, and the 3D printer prints out a little small robot. The big robot grabs that little small 3D printed robot and drops it behind the drawers. Yeah? What should be the body of that small robot so that it can get behind the drawers and be recoverable by the big robot? I don't know. 
That's I, my personal opinion about where evolutionary robotics could fit into the future landscape of AI and robotics. There are going to be a lot of cases, I think, where it's going to be useful to design, automatically design in silico a robot's body and train it, print it, and deploy it out there into the world. We'll see. To be seen. Okay. Again, uh, apologies. You're going to see a lot of my old experiments for now. Here's a very old experiment of mine where the evolutionary algorithm is evolving body and brain. The fitness function is what in this case? What did I ask the evolutionary algorithm to evolve the robots to do? Dance, maybe. They're doing a good job of that. Walk somewhere. Walk somewhere. Walk in which direction? Into the distance, away, exactly. There's a bilaterally symmetric robot. The left side of its body looks like the right side of its body, but it didn't do what we wanted it to do, so it's going to be deleted. Then there are these things that are not bilaterally symmetric. The left side of the body does not look like the right side of the body, but it is doing what we want it to do. More perverse instantiation. Again, we'll talk about biomechanics. One of the good ways to move in a particular direction in an efficient way is to be bilaterally symmetric. The left side of your body looks like the right side of your body. One of the fun things about working with evolutionary algorithms is they often rediscover things that Mother Nature already discovered several billion years ago, things that work. Sometimes the evolutionary algorithm comes up with things that Mother Nature never discovered, like wheels. We'll see some examples of that later. OK. So two reasons why you might want to uh, evolve robots rather than train them. As Nate mentioned uh, a couple minutes back, one of the common approaches in AI is to fix the architecture of the brain of the robot. The, the robot has a bunch of neurons represented by circles here, and then it's got a bunch of synapses, which are represented by these arrows connecting these neurons together. If you make these connections stronger or weaker, you alter the way, you alter the way in which sensation is transformed into action. But how do we know that six neurons and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, how do we know that six neurons and eight synapses is the right architecture for the brain of the robot? Short answer is we don't know. That's another non-intuitive thing. So maybe we expand the evolutionary algorithm so it also starts to tinker with the architecture of the neural network. We're gradually expanding the stuff broadening the stuff that the evolutionary algorithm can tinker with. Think about Google's Palmy robot that I just showed you. No matter how sophisticated a neural architecture we come up with for that robot, it can't reach behind the drawers. So maybe we expand the evolutionary algorithm further. So now it can tinker not just with the strength of connections, between neurons. It can also tinker with neural architecture, and it can also tinker with body plan, which is what biological evolution does. It tinkers with all of these things simultaneously. OK. Another rationale for why we might want to evolve robots rather than just fix their bodies and train their brains is Mother Nature has given us an example that evolution can produce very competent and generally safe autonomous machines. OK. A little detail about evolutionary algorithms and machine learning. Uh, there's a lot of jargon. I'm going to try and throw as little jargon at you as possible. One of the big challenges in robotics is lack of supervision. And here's what I mean by that. Here's yet another experiment of me trying to evolve a bipedal robot to walk. And after a few steps, after a few steps, it falls over. Inside, uh, inside the brain of that robot, where did the mistake arise? Why did it fall over after six steps? How do we work backward from the behavioral failure? 
to identify where the problem is. or that it just like it could invalidly think that it just took too many steps and it already achieved the goal by taking less steps okay yeah it's a, it's a good start maybe the evolutionary algorithm can identify something in the gate that was wrong the robot took too big a step and then it's, it became unstable and fell over but we we can't stop at behavior we have to work backward to the cause of the behavior the way in which the robot was transforming sensation into action to fix that upstream problem so that the next time we simulate the robot, it'll take more steps. Okay, in the interest of time, the answer is it's super hard to do. It's hard to go back and say this number in the brain of the nonoped was the problem or this particular synapse should have been st slightly stronger or slightly weaker. And if it was, the robot would take more steps. It's hard to have a supervisor inside the computer. It's hard to have an actual piece of code called a supervisor that watches problems with the behavior and knows where the problem is. It supervises by saying, fix this. Super, super hard problem. It's kind of an open problem. It's on the brink of being solved. Until it's solved well, evolution doesn't care. Evolution, or the fitness function, just gives back one number. This brain caused the biped to take seven steps. This brain caused the robot to only take six steps. Evolution doesn't know or care why this brain produced slightly better behavior than this brain. It just throws this brain away and makes randomly modified copies of this one. Evolutionary algorithms require no supervision. That's another reason why we're using an evolutionary algorithm. So far, so good? Okay. Okay. We're almost done lecture one. We'll finish with this video. In the interest of time, I'm going to speed it up a little bit. Here's an evolutionary algorithm that's tuning the musculature of the body and the brain of the robot. This is a much more sophisticated physics engine uh, than we're going to be using in this class. This is just to give you a sense for what's possible. Another way to visualize the evolutionary algorithm, how progress is being made. When this video came out in 2006, there was an immediate meme that went viral, which is, if ever there was a video that summarized a case of the Mondays, that, that's it. Okay. All right. All right. Again, my apologies. We're a little bit behind. We're going to move on. We're going to spend the next six minutes introducing, uh, starting a very short history of AI. It's a fascinating subject. There could be an entire course on this. So my apologies. We're going to go very fast. In this history of AI, we're going to go back, we're going to start a couple centuries in the past with Kohito Ergo Sum, who said it. I promised you there'd be some philosophy in this class. Here it is. Descartes. Descartes. You'll remember, as I mentioned last time, that going forward, you're going to see a few slides in which uh, there's a prompt for you to annotate. This is from Rene Descartes' Discourse on Method. It is one of the most beautiful and subtle arguments in all of Western thought. 
So I'm going to do some violence to that subtle argument now by boiling it down into six bullet points in English. Okay, I think therefore I am. Let's just say that. We could rephrase this as, as do I exist? Am I real? Hard to actually know if you think about it. But for Descartes, there seemed to be something asking the question. Answering the question is hard, but something if the question is there, something must be asking the question. So for René, that thing, whatever that thing is, he was going to call it the I. That's the thing that's asking the question. For René, this I was probably the soul, something like uh, the soul. That, for Descartes, he could be sure, he had confidence that it existed because it's the thing that's asking the question. That's what he could be sure of. This stuff that seems to be there, that he couldn't be so sure of. So for Descartes, there seemed to be this division between I and everything else, including the body. This, created, this conclusion that mind or soul or self or I is separate from this thing, which we'll call a body, is separate, is known as Cartesian dualism. It basically carved these two things in half which is also often known as the mind-body problem because it causes a lot of problems when we try and think through these ideas. What could this possibly have to do with the class on robotics? Why would we start a history of AI here? It seems an odd place to start. <clears throat> We need a mind and a body for robot. The fact that you phrased the statement in that way is a legacy of Cartesian dualism, right? We tend to think of, I've already mentioned brain and body of the robot. I'm, I'm doing it too. I've mentioned already in this class the field of robotics and AI. What distinguishes these two fields? Body. One field, AI, throws away the body. I don't care about the body. The thing that really matters is this thing. Roboticists say, no, 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 no. You can't throw away the body. It matters. The very structure in the way we try and create intelligent machines as a global society is fundam has fundamentally been influenced and biased by Cartesian thought. OK, I've got two minutes left. So we're going to jump from 1637 to 1936. We're going to jump forward 299 years. Hopefully, for most of you, we're in a little bit more familiar territory. This is the Turing machine. Anybody want to hazard a one or two sentence description of what a Turing machine is? Uh, it's a model for general computation. It's a model for general computation. What are the basic building blocks of a Turing machine? There's like a pointer, a big tape, and a set of instructions. Excellent. So yep. Like three things. OK, so a set of instructions, which is the tape, that's the input to the Turing machine. The Turing machine moves over a tape or moves the tape through itself and reads stuff off the tape, internally cogitates, and then writes stuff back onto the tape. When we think about our own behavior, we often think about sensation coming in, grinding away at that, se that incoming sensory information, maybe mixing it with our past experiences and memories, and then producing actions as a result. We are also influenced in thinking about how we think by Turing and the way we should go about thinking about robots. Like us, it's obvious. Robots should take in sensory information, grind away internally on that information, and then produce actions as a result. There are other ways to think about intelligent action. This is only one way. Most of us tend to fall into this way of thinking because of our Western inheritance, this and this. Okay, the only point I wanna make here with this before we break 
is that there are some very old ideas in Western thought that influence the way we think about trying to create useful and safe machines. Maybe, ultimately, the way to make safe and intelligent machines is to militate against these views, come up with new ways of approaching the creation of intelligent machines. Maybe some of these old ideas are actually holding us back. We'll come back to that later. Thanks very much. You have quiz number two due at 11.59 p.m. tonight. Undergraduates, you're working on assignment one. Graduate students, you're working on assignment one and two. I'll see you all again on Tuesday. Thank you.